We have jumped into a new series entitled Local Impact. And over this series, uh, we are inviting some of our partners from the community to come in and uh, to share with us updates about what God is doing kind of in and through their ministries and talk about how we can be praying for them. But as well as we're in this series, one of the things that we're doing as we get into God's word is we're asking God to reveal to us how it is that he wants to shape us as his people as we go out into our community and into the world to share the good news of his son, Jesus Christ. And uh, you'll, if you were here last week, uh, we had Savannah Martin from the Pregnancy Center who came and uh, not only shared about the incredible work that is going on through their ministry, but really set us up to talk about how we are to lead with love in the way that we approach people in our community. And uh, we are blessed this morning as we continue in this series to have Pat Cannon with us from that neighborhood church. Uh, as I shared earlier this morning in the first service, I got to know Pat uh, 10 years ago when I came to Westgate, and he was the children's ministry director, and I got to have just a small glimpse into the window of what God was doing in his heart and shaping him to then go down and pastor that neighborhood church, uh, which is in North Toledo, uh, one of the areas in our city uh, that is very impoverished and has lots and lots of need for people to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he has been faithfully serving there for a number of years, and I am excited that he is here to share with us this morning. So would you please welcome Pat as he comes up here and joins me on stage. Thank you, brother. And uh, Pat, as you get started this morning, would love for you to share just a little bit of an update with us about what God is doing in your life and in through the ministry of that neighborhood church, but also three or four concrete ways that we as a church can continue to be praying for you and for the ministry. Awesome. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Okay, so a couple things. Just to update you on, we uh, finished renovating our Youth Development Center. That is a crucial piece to the puzzle for us. Um, the, uh, the first floor is where tutoring takes place, Bible studies will happen. The second floor is called the Aspire Center. That's all entrepreneurial environments. And so um, there's a recording studio video recording studio up there. There's a photography studio up there. There's a place where they're learning how to design and imprint clothing. In fact, we actually have our second order now for uh, shirts. Um, and there's an organization in Toledo. They were our first ones that uh, had us make some shirts for them. And so we're on our second order for that. And uh, the, the students are also going to be designing our own clothing line, which is going to be kind of crazy. Um, and uh, we're going to be imprinting those. You'll be able to see that eventually on our website. Um, but uh, so that's taking place. The other part is the Plank Factory. Uh, I know I've been talking to you about that through a couple years. Uh, we actually have it all renovated now. We're just waiting for our final occupancy permit so that we can actually move the machinery in there. That's our employment life skill environment. And what that's going to do is we're going to teach our neighbors how to work. We'll be employing uh, some of our neighbors, some ex-offenders will be employed there. We'll be repurposing wooden pallets to make clocks and furniture, things like that. So I actually have a very important meeting with the mayor uh, this coming week. It's on the 29th. So if you can be praying about that, uh, we're trying to get over a few hurdles um, in order for us to get that final occupancy permit. So be praying for that. The other thing I really need you to be praying for, summer in our, uh, my neighborhood is the most dangerous time uh, throughout the whole year for children and students because they have a lot of time on their hands. And so some of the most toxic things that have ever taken place happen during the summer. So if you could commit to pray throughout the summer for our children and our students, that God would put a hedge of protection around them all summer long, all right, as we continue to interact with them and Help them to lean in towards God, all right? So this morning, um, I'm going to show you a video that's going to kind of set up where I'm going today. Um, believe it or not, I'm going to revisit the same passage that Rob uh, um, talked about last week. But we're going to look at it from a different perspective, okay? And we're going to look at it from a different angle for us this morning. So watch this, and then we'll jump into it. Here we go.
So I want to start off by taking a little survey this morning. How many of you would say that you've experienced brokenness in your life? Raise your hand. Okay, stop. I want you to look around the room. The reality is that's normal for every human being on the planet. That's normal. And yet it's this brokenness that makes us want to hide while having a desire to be fully known and loved. There's this old Presbyterian preacher. I want you to listen to how he describes this brokenness in us. He says, I have come to believe that by and large, the human family all has the same secrets which are both very telling in the sense that they tell what is perhaps the central paradox of our condition. That what we hunger for, perhaps more than anything else, is to be known in our full humanness. And yet that is often just what we also fear more than anything else. I was looking on um, uh, a blog and there was a couple comments by um, a couple people about this whole aspect of brokenness in our lives. Listen to what this says by this young lady named Bethany. She says, it's difficult to find a safe environment to allow every aspect, both good and the ugly, to be known. It's also exhausting to keep up the pretense that everything is just flowers, sunshine, and bunnies in my life. It's strange that I would label myself as a people person, but I only let people into a small part of my life, controlling what people do or do not see, but longing to be fully understood. Then a young man named Jason said this, yeah, being open and honest about the good and the ugly is difficult, but it is not natural for us. That's why we need communities which seek to create safe environments where human beings can be real. The church should be leading the way in this, but unfortunately, this isn't always the case. So here's the one thing that I want you to get this morning. Above anything else that you get this morning, here's the one thing I want you to get. How I see... Others is directly connected to how I embrace God's view of me. How I see others is directly connected to how I embrace God's view of me. So I want you to go to John chapter 8. And we're going to start in verse number 1. We're going to look at this from a perspective of, do you see me? Do you see me? We're going to start in verse number one. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. And a crowd soon gathered, and he sat down to to teach them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the very act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Okay, now stop for a second. Okay, stop. I want you to think of the worst sin you have ever committed. Right now, just put it in your mind, the worst sin you have ever committed. Okay, so let's just say... um, after the, the moment you're done committing your sin, there's a pounding on your door. And you open the door, and there's your friend. And your friend is out there, and you open the door, and he says, it's all over Facebook. It's all over Facebook. And you're like, what, what? What are you talking about? What's all over Facebook? He's like, it's going viral. And they pull out their phone and they show you and they open up Facebook and there it is in living color, your worst sin. That's exactly how this woman is feeling at that very moment. The last thing she wants to be done is to be seen, let alone known. 
And that's exactly what's taking place. Like it or not, we're seeing her. We're seeing her. And then in verse four, it says, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They're trapping Jesus. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his fingers. And they just kept going on and on and on about that. They kept demanding an answer. He stood up again and said, all right, all right, all right, right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Okay, so right here, you know what Jesus is doing? He's putting everybody on a level playing field right now. Everybody's on a level playing field. And then it says, he stooped down again, wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Do you know why the oldest left? Okay, I'm telling you, as you get older, you know how much of a sinful person you are. And they left first. So there this woman is, in front of the Pharisees, in front of the crowd. How did they see this woman? How did they see her? Let's take the Pharisees first, okay? The religious leaders. These are the guys that get paid to train, to help people connect with God. That's their job. This is how they saw her. Deserving of death. Without hope disqualified from God's love. I wonder how many of us here sitting here right now have ever felt disqualified from God's love. Forever labeled insignificant. That was a label. She was gonna have that label for the rest of her life. That's how the Pharisees labeled her. How about the... So here's the thing about us. Okay, so... When we're going to see somebody, there are some things that like get in the way. And the first thing that I want you to recognize this morning is how I see others is often clouded by my own self-righteousness. Because see, what we do is um, we, 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 we look at ourselves and we, I, we, we, we create this, um, this measuring stick as far as, well, I'm this good, so that's how, we, that's how we put ourselves. And then when we start to look at other people, we start to compare it to, I'm this good. Are they measuring up or not? And so how we see people, a lot of times, is connected to our own self-righteousness. What about the crowd? How did the crowd see this woman? They didn't know what was going to be happening. And now all of a sudden, here this woman is put right in the middle of the crowd. Maybe they knew who this woman was. Maybe she had a reputation. But I'm thinking that they saw her, number one, is she was caught in the act. She was caught. She was labeled as a whore from this point on. She was despised by those in authority. She was without hope. And I guarantee you, if I was in that crowd, I would be glad it wasn't me. And so that's the second thing that gets in the way of us really seeing people. How I see others is often conditioned by the thoughts of others. Down at TNC, this happens all the time. I, I mean, I have people that come in on Saturday nights and it is almost inevitable that somebody comes up to me and starts demonizing another person before they even get there. And it's like now, all of a sudden, now I've got to fight against those things in order for me to truly see the person, the other person that's going to come in. 
So a lot of times how we see people is determined by the thoughts of others. Okay, so the Pharisees looked at her. She's disqualified. The crowd looked at her. She is without hope. How did she view herself? How did this lady view herself? Number one is she felt disqualified from God's love at that very moment. She was a disappointment to others and to God. She would be forever labeled. And she would be without hope. She was disqualified. She was a disappointment. She was labeled. She was without hope. Here's the third thing that gets in the way for us truly seeing people. I see others. It's connected to how I see myself. To how I see myself. I'm telling you, there are some people down at TNC um, they're some of the most broken people I know, but they're also some of the most forgiving people that I've ever talked to before. They know they're broken. In fact, they expect you to be broken. That's part of who they are. It's part of who they are. So now we have the Pharisees, you're disqualified. The crowd, you're without hope. How she sees herself, I'm disqualified. And then Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus comes on the scene, starting in verse number 10. Listen to what this says. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't one of them, even one of them condemn you? I don't see him. No, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. So now here's an incredible thing that just took place. Jesus is going to see this lady. He's actually going to see her. And listen to how Jesus saw her. She saw her as not worthless, but valued. She saw her as not labeled, but loved. He saw her as not condemned, but forgiven. He saw her as not excused, but pardoned. In other words, he saw her need for a savior. He saw her need for a savior. Without condemnation, Jesus loved her while not watering down her sin. I am so sick of this happening within the church. People down in my neighborhood on a Saturday night, we talk about sin all the time because they know this is a normal part of my life. In fact, this is the number one thing that makes me feel disqualified with God. Disqualified with God. Here's the thing. Um, God never calls us to sugarcoat sin, ever. Ever. It's our sin that should be causing us to lean in towards Jesus. Because he's the only one that can not only pay for it, but break the power of it in our lives. I want to read something to you. This is from a book called Messy Grace. And this book is written by a guy who is a pastor whose mom and dad were both gay. And he grew up 
in that environment. And he experienced firsthand the hatred from those that call themselves Christ followers. In fact, he grew up believing that Christians hate gay people. And then God did something amazing. He got a hold of his life. He became a pastor. He now pastors a, a church. But I want you to listen to what he says about acceptance without approval. Listen to what this says. I wasn't going to have I wasn't going to have an easy time showing love to my parents. He says you'll see what I mean in the next chapter, but he says I dare say you won't have an easy time showing love to unbelievers in your life either, regardless of their story. He says over time, however, I have discovered a distinction that'll help us hold on to both grace and truth in our relationships with people who don't know Christ. We can accept others as friends or family without approving of their life choices. He says, I know for a fact that every Sunday I shake hands with men who have been secretly on websites they shouldn't be on, and yet I still accept them. I know there are women who greet me on Sunday morning just after gossiping about someone else. I can accept a person who has a huge jealousy issue and not, disagree, and not agree with their choices. I'm still friends with people who have anger issues and yet I don't agree with what they do. You and I have a, rela have a relationship with somebody who is hooked on drugs and we can still um, accept them and not approve of the choices this person makes. I have people down at TNC every single week who still go out and they get wasted during the week. And yet they come in on Saturday hoping they're not disqualified. He says, what I'm talking about is accepting, which is different than approving. To approve of something means that you're throwing your support behind an action, a lifestyle, or a thing. It's possible to accept people without approving of their decisions or how they live life. Jesus did it all the time. If you look at the Gospels and the unbelievers Jesus interacted with, he was always showing love to them and spending time with them, but never approved of any kind of sin that people would commit. Yet that never stopped him from loving an individual, ever, ever. So how does this play out? with us every day? How does this live itself out when, when we as broken human beings try to actually see and know other broken human beings and help them to lean in towards God? What does that look like for us? So I'm gonna tell you a couple stories. Okay, before um, Kelly and I, when we, before we moved into the um, hood. We were still living outside Perrysburg. And our oldest daughter, Emily, had a friend of hers that was kind of basically ending up homeless. He was a gay young man. He had no place to stay. We had a big basement. So I was like, you know, we're like, you know what? He can come stay with us. And so we just kind of made him part of our family. We loved that young man. I had so many conversations with him. And I'll never forget that during on Christmas, when he was sitting there with us on Christmas, and we had gotten him some things, and I'll never forget, he just ended up in tears. Because we had spent time getting trying to see him. Just uh, last week, I uh, was at uh, Max and Irma's on Dussel. 
was having lunch with somebody. And so like, if you know me, you go out to lunch with me. I'm pretty much more often than not, after we're done, when the waiter or waitresses, they're getting finished, whatever, I'll say, I'll say, whoa, 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 before you go. If there was anything that you would like somebody to pray into your life, what would it be? Okay, so we're getting done, you know, with dinner and stuff, and she's, you know, cleaning up everything or whatever, and so she's getting ready to go, whatever. I say, whoa, 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 hold on. I, before you go, I just want to know, what is, what is the one thing, if somebody was to pray anything into your life, what would it be? And, and then all of a sudden she stops, and she goes, don't make me start crying at work. And she goes, I'm single, I have four kids, and I found out that she's working two jobs. She wants to go to get a degree. And as I'm talking to her, she's like, I know. Oh, I don't need a man in line of life. I just need, I just need God to show me that he loves me. That he wants to provide for me. And so we talked with her and, you know, said, what would you like us to pray for? She's like, I just, I just want God to provide. So, you know, we pay her thing and go and whatever. And she goes and does that. And after she leaves, after we're sitting at the table and we pray. She was desperate to be seen. I wonder how many people you have like that in your neighborhood. I wonder how many people you have like that in your job. I wonder how many people that are like that that you interact with on a regular basis. And because we're so busy doing what we're doing, we choose not to see. So I'm going to have the worship team come on up for this last song. And while they're going to be playing this song, I have two questions that I want you to ask yourself as a challenge this week, okay? Here's the first one. Who is the one person that I need to see this week? Who's the one person that I need to see this week? Somebody you know? Somebody you pass by all the time? Who is that? Who is the one person that I need to see? Question number two. How can I let them know I see them as God sees them? How can I let them know I see them as God sees them? Because see, here's the thing, okay? Talking about being the church in the streets, okay? That is not an event. Do you know what that is? That is a culture. And that is what Rob and the rest of his team, that's what they're trying to create here is a culture where it's normal for you to see people. And as you continue to see people and they continue to feel that love, guess what? That causes them to start to lean in towards God. Because the number one way that they're going to know that your faith is real, it's not by going to church. It's not by going to Bible studies. It's not by memorizing scripture. It's not by any of those things. Do you know what the number one way is? The number one way is, is when you're going to love them. That's how they're going to know that your faith is real. So that's my challenge for you today. Last quote by a guy named Tim Keller. Listen to what he says. 
To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, it's a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything else. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw us. Who are you going to see? Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. I am so glad that you have chosen to see me. Even in the midst of my brokenness, would you help me, help me to see people like you do? And as I'm going through my day, Holy Spirit, would you cause me to see, to focus on someone that needs to know I see you and so does God. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your love for us. And I pray as this builds into our life, God, that you would change this city, that they would come to know you, your, building, your kingdom would be built, and our faith would grow. In the authority of your name, we pray. Amen.